Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Peace be with you. Um, thank you very much for coming to this second, in the second series of the Paradigm Shift. Um, our topic for tonight is we don't need God, we have science. A big debate that rages through centuries and generations uh, between the belief in science and scientific methods and the belief in God. I'm not going to talk too much here. I'm going to give a very brief introduction. I'm going to pass over to this team to say uh, Dr. Hassan Sada, and then over to you guys as well. Please feel free to join in. Um, put your hands up. I'll try and get through as many people as possible to speak and to have a chance to contribute. Um, one of the feedbacks we got from the last event that we had was the outcome of what we're doing here today. We're not here to solve uh, an age-old crisis or question. We're here to discuss it and see if we can come to a reasonable conclusion um, while also looking at both sides of the story. Sayyid Hassan will be going through that shortly, so I won't take any of his uh, points. Um, but we realize there is a growing, and especially with the media and social media and increased media in the world, there's a growing need for people to have answers and to speak and to discuss, hence an event such as this. They, some of the arguments that, uh, that science bring forward is that religion can bring people towards things like fundamentalism, violence, and death and destruction. Whereas religion can go back to science and say the exact same thing. Experimentation, creating bombs, these kind of things can do the same. Um, so what we try to do here today is look at how these two things can work together. They're not mutually exclusive. Are they um, inherently able to work together to create a better society through both religion and science? I want to give one quote which I found which I think is really um, apt and really um, worthwhile for the discussion um, by uh, one of the great astronomers and scientists of the past um, few decades. He passed away about 20 years ago. He started a program called The Cosmos, um, very famous in America. Um, and his name was Carl Sagan. Science is not only compatible with spirituality, it's a profound source of spirituality. When we recognize our place in an immensity of light years and in the passage of ages, when we grasp the intricacy, beauty and subtlety of life, then that soaring feeling, that sense of elation and humility combined is surely spiritual. So are our emotions in the presence of great art, literature or acts of extreme, selfless, courageous acts, such as those of Mahatma Gandhi or Martin Luther King. The notion that science and spirituality are somehow mutually exclusive does a disservice to both. With that, I'm going to pass over to Dr. Sayyid Hassan Sada, who most of you will know from the community as being one of the most hardworking and biggest contributors to, uh, but not just in London, the community in London, but all around the country and all around the world. If you could please welcome him with a round of applause. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. A very minor contributor. Very minor contributor. Uh, thank you very much, Munir, for this introduction. And thank you very much uh, for the organizers for holding today's discussion. Uh, and thanks for the audience for attending. Um, I have about eight or nine slides that I hope the discussion will revolve around. Uh, by the end of the presentation, um, the slides will be played in the background. Um, so inshallah, it will remind the audience of the main points of the discussion. Uh, I will struggle, because I usually talk when I'm standing, but for the sake of the event, I'll, I'll remain seated. Uh, but forgive me if I uh, halfway through stand up. I guess the background of uh, the speaker is important. Um, I'm a hematologist, I'm a doctor who practices uh, science and a bit more than science in medicine every day. I've studied here, I've earned my specialization in, in hematology, blood diseases, and with the grace of God, I'm still practicing. 
So I know something about the topic of science. I don't want anyone here to think um, that we are against science, but let me be very clear, I am against the misuse of science, and it will become quite obvious from the discussion. What is the definition of science? Now, the right and correct definition is that it is a systematic body of knowledge regarding any subject, any topic, usually used for, for the uh, field of knowledge that studies the natural world, or as it's described, the physical world. But uh, the actual word science doesn't just mean, it's not confined to the physical world. Systematic organized body of knowledge of any particular subject. And the definition of the physical world is quoted there. Hope you can see it on the screen. I'll keep looking down my screen. Anything that, that you can perceive through the five senses. So it is any topic that's being studied, the science of that particular topic, whether it's physical or metaphysical commonly used for the physical world and you know it's not a it's not the wrong cue the wrong use but even the topic of, of uh, the title of today's discussion it's relating to the science that studies the physical world um, well I hope you appreciate you all appreciate by the end of it that there is more than just the physical world our world has more than the physical dimension the Sciences that study those other elements are also sciences, should be fall under science. God is the creator. Now, when different people talk about God, they are talking about the same one, the creator. However, there are some big and fundamental differences in which people describe the attributes of this God. We're talking about the same God, but there are people who have different understandings of his attributes. And the attributes of God are very, very important because towards the end of the presentation, I will share with you what does the belief in God offer us. We will discuss what science should offer us, but we'll also come back to what does the belief in God, what does it offer us? but God with the right and correct understanding of his attributes, not the misunderstanding. Islam, the religion of the Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa it uses a rational foundation to understand the attributes of God, and it makes it, in the world of religion, quite unique. This foundation of rationality before you start opening the Holy Quran and read up about God, you should have used and exercised the rational process of thinking about the proof of the existence of the Creator, his main attributes, then you open the Quran and then you read it based on this foundation, based on the conclusions of the foundation of the rational thinking. So rational thinking than the holy texts. And trust me, believe me, there is no contradiction. I accept that not all Muslims are familiar with this. Some Muslims, like followers of other religions, they are not so familiar with the rational foundation. And in fact, they don't use it. There are people out there who are against the use of rational thinking in religion and within Islam as well. But. We're here to present a view, uh, a view that is so ancient in the world of Islam, and it continues to be studied and practiced until today. Rational foundation, then the Holy Scripture. And the rational foundation helps you to understand the Holy Scriptures in the correct way. 
rarely used with God. We try and be rational to understand a lot of things, but when it comes to the Creator, unfortunately, we're a bit lazy. Um, maybe because people fear the conclusions. And if you fear something and you know it's coming, you might just cancel the path that leads you towards it. Um, most writers I read for who wrote about arg the argument for that God does not exist either do not use the rational thinking or they have a major misunderstanding of the rational process of thinking. Just because you're a scientist, just because you've studied science, doesn't mean that you know the correct process of the rational thinking, of the use of logic. Just because you have a, a name attached to you, a degree, a higher degree, you're a professor of something, you're a consultant in something, doesn't mean that you, necess that you necessarily understand it. And I've seen this in so many writings written to argue against the existence of God. Uh, which is why I, th I believe, personally, that the vast majority of those people are misinformed. Misinformed. They, you know, they, they've got the wrong information. That's why they have this conclusion. And in Islam, we're encouraged not to make any judgments on people because we always give people the benefit of the doubt. They probably are misinformed. And amongst them, the people who argue against the existence of God. And also, there's a psychological barrier against the belief in God. I think I'm going to stand up. You have to forgive me, sorry. Uh, there is a psychological barrier against the belief in God, and that is because of the, the malpractices of followers of religion. When people have God, they kind of block rationality, and they start thinking, they have images of people who've mispracticed religion. Oh, God is associated with religion. I know so many people, and I've heard, and I read, and I've seen, about people who've mispracticed religions throughout human history until today. Some of them are politically motivated, some of them are misinformed. And that's why the whole concept of God just, you know, there's a psychological barrier. There's an invisible wall. I don't want to be associated with those people. Hence, the foundation, God does not exist. So it's psychological. And you find this. You find this in many writers. You find this in very famous books out there, arguing against God. Half of the book is about emotional experiences, negative experiences with people of religion. But we're not arguing for religion. We're arguing for God here. So why are you bringing your kind of negative experience with the people of faith? Anyway. So we either don't use rationality or we block it because we have misunderstandings about religion or mispractices. So some of the uh, misunderstandings about God is that, did I switch it off? Yes. I did. Let's have a lot salawat. Oh. It's back. <laughs> so quick. Thank you very much. I'll make sure I don't use that again. So well, a very common understanding that God has an image, a human being or another form. That is one of the greatest misunderstandings. That's why when you talk to people, and I appreciate most people here are, are Muslims, and in fact, some Muslims believe that you can see God, the shape of God, the form of God in this life. And some believe you'll see him in the afterlife. Obviously, the school that we belong to, we believe that he does not. He cannot have a shape or form because he's limitless. And you can't limit him to anywhere. The moment you can see him is the moment you have located him and limited him to a particular space. So this is one of the main misunderstandings. When you, talk to, when you talk to people about God and they don't believe in God, they have this image in their mind, not that one. Some, if you, if you open the scriptures of, of some religions, and even in Islam we have some uh, uh, quotes that have been introduced wrongly, of course, on behalf of the Prophet, to say that certain decisions by God are based on, you know, anger and revenge and, you know, not the most wise, the most merciful, not 
the translation of in the name of God, the most merciful, the all, the all merciful, the most merciful, Ar-Rahman, Ar-Rahim, the most compassionate or the most merciful. Not that, you know, revenge, anger. And when you ask, well, not when you ask, the vast majority of people, when they have, you know, when they're trying to ask the question of why we are here, they think it's a punishment. Punishment of our mother, Hawa, Eve. Or you've been punished for a previous life, or some kind of a punishment. Not the opportunity to ascend to him towards perfection. That's what the belief in God offers, really. So what can science offer? We'll talk about that. Misconceptions, and also we'll come back to towards God. So science, I testify, it can offer us a better relationship with our environment. I'm trying to be very, very careful with my choice of words. We're talking about the science of the physical world here. It can offer us, and it has offered us, he says, a better relationship with our environment. Sources of energy, methods of transport, insulation. It can be misused, we'll talk about that later. But better relationship with the environment. We understand more about it. We can use it, hopefully, in a better way, not misuse it, and optimize our use. Progress in healthcare, of course. Uh, maybe we should have said medicine then rather than healthcare. And partly, science, the science of natural world, has helped us have a better well-being. The definition of health these days is not the absence of disease. It's the well-being. But it should be holistic. It should be physical well-being, psychological, mental, and emotional. The study of the physical world helps you, helps us, has helped humanity to have a better control of disease, prevention of disease, treatment of disease, maybe cure in some circumstances. But I have to testify as a doctor that the study of the physical world cannot completely eliminate other causes of not being healthy. And the prime one, which is the rising phenomena in the West, is depression is related to your goals in life, the sense of hopelessness, decisions that you should take, prioritization, how you should view life. The physical world cannot provide you answers there. So psychological and mental well-being means something else. So partly it helps us, but not, not on its own. And obviously, it can be misused. This is what science can offer. It can offer, you know, the opportunity for a much larger scale of destruction. And it has. It has. You could use it this way, or you could use it the other way. So for those who say, who argue for that we don't need God, we have science, you know, they need to study the unfortunate history of wars of our country, of our countries, of our planet. Science has helped us as a race to destroy others and also, uh, unfortunately, destroy the environments as well, aspects of it. So the, some of the common misconceptions about God, Afwan, about science, is that it can explain everything. That's a big misconception. It can't. Because simply, we're talking here about science of the physical world, Simply, there are dimensions of this world that exist that are not so physical. Now, people are struggling with the definition of what physical is, by the way. But let's just assume it is whatever you can perceive through your five senses. Um, there are, you know, there's a dimension of our world that is beyond the five senses. And it does exist. It does exist. And we're certain about it. Rationally speaking, we're certain about it. And we're not going to change the conclusion. Um, and we're happy to explain it. So, science cannot explain everything. Uh, science is always right. Once you have a conclusion by a scientist or a group of scientists in a particular decade, 
That's it. It's right. It will always be right. No. No. We've, we're talking about the profession of doctors. We've used drugs to help patients. And after so many years, we found out that they were a catastrophe. They caused a catastrophe. They were, we were wrong. We were wrong. We gave people products without knowing what's inside them fully. So is it always right? No, it can change. If you reach a conclusion in 2018, that's the conclusion for 2018. It could change later on. So that's not always right. It's right for that time, for that aspect that it is studying, but it could change. And just because it can change, if you see the last point, I don't want people to leave this room and mistrust scientists. It's like when I told a brother the other day, I said to him, this increases the risk of cancer. He said to me, Hassan, everything increases the risk of cancer these days. There's so many, you know, research about it that, you know, I don't care anymore. No, no, that's, that's the wrong attitude. Just because there's so much, you know, so much information out there and misinformation, you should not mistrust scientific findings. You should pause study them and think about them okay so please do not leave this program having mistrust in science know that it can change but you know you should this is a gift from god science study of the physical world is a gift from god make sure you understand it and you appreciate it another big mis misconception is that it can, science can be your philosophy in life and I appreciate this is a kind of a, a deep concept. Philosophy is another commonly used word. It's used in this presentation to describe the knowledge that's, that is associated and the subject of it is the existence. That kind of knowledge is superior to science. Philosophy the way you organize your thoughts to come up with a conclusion, hopefully using the rational approach. I fully appreciate that there are philosophers out there who don't use it. Just because they don't use it doesn't mean that we abandon philosophy. Just because some philosophers are not happy with the rational thinking and not, they can't get a conclusion out of it. The, the correct use of philosophy, the studying of the... The, the existence is that you use rational thinking, logic, and you understand the existence. Why it exists, how it can exist, what are the players, and what could be the players. Um, some people are trying to replace that with science. So science is the new philosophy, and that's a big misconception. A big misconception, because logic and rationality is superior to science. Quickly... Some things should stay the same. Us, me, it should say me and us, we have relationship with God, we have relationship with the environment, and we have relationship with others. Now, I appreciate that some people would have liked me or us to be at the center, and you say, well, we have a relationship between us and God, us and others, us and the environment. But on purpose, I place God at the center. As a reminder for myself and for the respected audience, is that God, Allah Jalla Jalalu, should remain at the center. This religion has a different lens. We don't believe in person-centered, self-centered way of life. We believe it should be God-centric. So God is at the center, not us. But the relationship is us and God, us and others, us and the environment. Science, scientific discoveries of the physical world, help with the environment, us and the environment. It should have nothing to do with us and God. And I'm going to make a bold statement. Nothing to do with us and others. The way we respect our fathers in 2018 should be the same way people respected their fathers a century ago. And the way we treat mercifully our neighbors in 2018 should be the same way that people have mercifully treated their neighbors 600 years ago and so on. 
I'm against this idea, concept that everything should change and everything should progress and everything should develop. Unfortunately, it doesn't develop. It, it regresses in some aspects. Final slide. For me, what can the belief in God offer you? It can offer you a vision, leadership, wisdom, happiness, and a better journey. The belief in God using the, using the rational foundation helps you to have a vision. You know where you're heading. Vision in the world of leadership and personal development is described as how do you perceive yourself in five or 20 years? The vision of this company, how do you want to see it in 20 years and work backwards? How do you want to see this business? How do you want to see the school? How do you want to see your family in 20 years? Plan it, imagine it, visualize it, and work backwards. The belief in God helps you because it gives you the vision of the future. The day of judgment is coming and eternal life is coming. So plan your life backwards. You know what's coming. Just imagine it. Live it and plan your life accordingly. Vision. Leadership and followership, it gives you the best role models, the belief in God, the prophets and the messengers. It gives you the best role models for you to follow and uh, walk down their path, the path that leads to perfection. Wisdom, it gives you a balanced way of life, a holistic, the belief in God. Teaches you how to pray, teaches you how to use science, it teaches you how to look after your mother, how to choose your spouse, how to bring up your child. It teaches you everything, a holistic way of life. And because religion touches on the heart and the mind, you get happiness. You get satisfied, but it quenches your thirst in those two aspects. And finally, it describes the journey for its reality, that it is re really, this life is about the journey mm -hmm. towards him, the journey towards perfection. And that's what your life should be, a journey towards Allah and towards perfection. Thank you very much. So, it's now time for you guys to contribute. I'm going to put away my microphone. You're only going to hear from Dr. Hassan. But I will ask, please keep the comments as short as possible. Um, if, I do, if you do go on a bit too long, I will unfortunately cut you off because um, we don't have a massive amount of time. So if anybody has a comment, a question, anything, please put your hand up. One of the guys will come with a microphone that's specifically for the TV channel. So just speak louder. You won't get at your speaker. So anybody you want to go first? From any of the boys or girls? or ladies or gentlemen? It can be a question as well. Because it does take time for people to get into it. Okay, there's someone at the back there. If you could stand up, please, as well, so we can all see you and hear you, and as loud as possible. Alaikum uh, Sayyid, for uh, someone that believes strongly in science, with it being logical positivism and the empirical method, it's very difficult to believe in a metaphysical world because to believe in that is dependent on believing in revelation partly. And if someone starts even from a Western philosophical perspective, um, they would still require some kind of empirical proof that the metaphysical world exists. That's why the scientific world has moved towards the idea that there is no metaphysical aspect, there is no soul. So people that have this belief, how would you approach this issue with them if they don't believe in religion, don't believe in God, and believe only in a logical empirical approach, logical positivism. Thank you very much. So how, how do we approach a, uh, this topic of the metaphysical world and someone who comes from a background saturated uh, against uh, this belief? I would start, number one, by clarifying the misconceptions. The ones I've listed about God, that the God we're talking about, I'm talking about, it's not God in the shape of a man, will it be it? Uh, we're not here um, um, by mistake, it's not a punishment and so on. Because trust me, the, the human being that you're discussing with is a human being. Before you've come to, to the scene, he's been reading up, she's been reading up about this for years. And God is always this old man or 
a different form. And God is, and religion is always associated with violence. So clarify those misconceptions and remind the respected colleague or friend is that there is a different science, not the just the science that studies the natural world. There's a different science called logic and rationality that has got its own formulas, its own rules. Just like, you know, you study medicine, and medicine is different from planning, planning, urban planning. Medicine is different to urban planning. There's two different sciences. So there's science in general of the natural world, and there is science of philosophy uh, that studies the existence, and it's got its own rules. You need to start with that. So clarify the misconceptions, and remind them there is a different science which is studying the existence. And using rationality, it shouldn't take you. Uh, I remember my days at George's, where it took us 15 minutes to show someone who's very strongly um, atheist that rationality can only prove the existence of a creator. And there was no argument against that, by the way. 15 minutes. Um, Alhamdulillah. But you just have to start the right, in the right way, the right approach. OK. I've got about 15 questions already on the website. I was not quite expecting so many. So okay. I've well, got a good one here that um, maybe one of the, uh, you guys sent through. Um, what changes do we see in religious societies as a consequence of the improvements from God, e.g., or i.e., education, economics, etc., are, and I'm going to add the word sometimes, are sometimes better in non religious communities? I can only speak on behalf of Islam, of course, because that's the religion I have studied some parts of it, and I respect other religions. Uh, with specifically Islam, there is a huge encouragement for humanity in general um, to better its understanding of the world, it, to better its understanding of the environment. And there are huge areas in life in which Islam left humanity to study and develop for itself. It didn't give strict rules. It didn't give you strict rules on how to treat an ill patient or how to travel. Just go there and discover the best way. So there is a huge encouragement. And just because today, today as in the 20th century, 21st century, you compare some countries that are predominantly Muslims versus other countries that are predominantly non-Muslims and you find better education and healthcare in the non-Muslims uh, in, in, in areas where non-Muslims are the vast majority of the population things were you know the other way around about a thousand years ago so it's nothing to do with religion you know nothing to do, it's to do with you us as people us as people it's how you how you interact with this religion. If you take the practice of the Ottoman Empire, you'll be completely against religion. I'm not saying other Muslim rulers were good, but there are certain politicians who have a particular view. The Ottomans didn't, didn't like science, just they suppressed science and scientific discoveries in the, in the, in the Muslim world, and people just regressed, among the others, other politicians. Ahsan, the... Um Argument always comes forward if you look at some of our own, maybe the Arabic Islamic societies, that they've regressed so much um, in current society compared to other uh, Western societies. But then if you look at other statistics like suicide and these kind of things, sometimes that can sway in the other favor, as you mentioned in your presentation, to do things like depression without a lack of a religion. Um, anybody on the floor who has a question or comment? Again, I've got loads here, but I'd prefer to hear from some of you. Yes? Um, alaikum, Doctor. Um, just so the title of the uh, topic is we don't need God we have science if I were to give you an alternative which says we have God so we don't need science how much would you agree with that statement and before you answer it you mentioned in the uh, lecture that for example a hundred years ago or 600 years ago you would expect the same thing so at the time for example of Rasulullah etc there was a limit in science for example so obviously now we're, we have more knowledge in topics but they lived a life which was a good life or an acceptable life. So what I'm trying to say is uh, if we have God, he gives us everything that we need. We don't need science. We have morality from God. We have uh, knowledge from God. 
rather. So just yeah. Again, I will I will uh, answer the question based on the religion I follow and study. Uh, the religion of Islam encourages people to study their environment, to study the physical world. And if science is, and it is, part of it is studying the physical world, then it is actually a matter of obligation. So here I am saying, in Islam, it is an obligation on the human race to advance in the science of the physical world. An obligation, not okay, so science is now here, we may, we may use it or we may not. It's an obligation. Um, the encouragement to seek knowledge, the encouragement to study fields that if, if you don't study it, there will be consequences for the rest of society, like medicine, like healthcare, like better planning, like better insulation for buildings, better use of, of, of energy and reducing waste. If there are negative consequences and none of the Muslims, no one in society studies them, the whole society becomes sinful. That's what the people in Najaf and Qom teach us, by the way. That's what the people, the scholars, the Grand Ayatollahs, our jurists, that's what they teach us. They say, if there's a particular field of knowledge, that if you don't, if the society does not study it, does not practice in it, and there were negative consequences on everybody else, you need at least one person. If it, if it suffices that one person does it, obviously, you need more than that. But if no one does it, the whole society is answerable. So in this religion, it's an obligation. But we know what to study. You study the environment. For the way you treat your parents, it should be the same. The, the, the way you search for a spouse, what criteria you want in your spouse should be the same. The way you approach you know, your poor neighbor, which could be here or could be another part of the world, since this is a small village now, should be the same, should be that mercy. You should feel responsible. You may use different methods, but the main moral values that govern the way we treat others and the way we interact with God should be exactly the same. That's why we pray exactly the same way the, pr the Prophet prayed 1,400 years ago, and we're not going to change it. Awesome. Very good question. Thank you. Um, before we go to Brother Naki in the audience, I've got a couple, there's so many questions on here, I have to take a couple from here, and obviously they've come from you guys. So I'm going to give two um, questions slash comments and quick one minute answers, if that's possible. Uh, you're going to solve all these problems in one minute. Can you believe in Charles Darwin's evolution and God? Science. Is, is God bound by logic? So the first question is, uh, unfortunately, Dar the, the theory of uh, Charles Darwin is being misapplied as a philosophy. It's nothing to do with the philosophy of the world. Charles Darwin had a theory um, about in the change in um, the living subjects, the living objects of this world. Um, the theory of evolution. It has got nothing to do with religion. You can believe uh, in that theory as a theory and also you know, believe in God, there's no contradiction. You could believe that the mechanism that Charles Darwin suggested is the mechanism through which God developed the world and there's nothing wrong with that at all. It's the new Darwinism that people, how they apply it against the existence of God, we have an issue with, because that's a, you know, it's misapplied. But if you ask me from a scientific point of view, and I've argued this since I was in my fourth year, half one, since my second year at medical school at St. George's, Charles Darwin's theory doesn't have evidence. And the evidence, he proposed it where people, the scientific community, had no idea about genes and genetics. When genes and genetics, which I studied part of in medicine, were discovered, it destroys the theory. But well, that's my view. Um, I'm sorry, the, the second? God, um, is God bound by logic? Um, is God bound by logic? Um, not because God is bound, 
because the reality, the reality is that the big is always bigger than the small. The part is always smaller than the whole. <clears throat> it's got nothing to do with God. Nothing to do with God. That's the reality. You have something small and something big, the big will always be bigger. So that egg that people think about, that it remains small, and they're trying to propose, propose. It's not a thing that exists. They propose that could God put the whole of earth being bigger than the egg inside the small egg? That thing is a proposal. It's not a thing. It's a thought you have in your mind. But the big will always and always remain bigger than the small. So is the path. So it's not God. It's the reality. Um, Brother Naki had a question or a comment. If you could just bear, one second, if you just get the microphone for a second. Yep. Assalamu alaikum, Dr. Hassan. Thank you for the great talk. And I hope I can ask this properly. Forgive me if I'm not able to. So, did I understand you correctly that religion and science are complementary? Because at a later stage, it sort of felt like religion in some ways supersedes science because it is divine, whereas science changes. And I guess also on that point, are the two in some ways complementary? So when you look at some of the work in theoretical physics, where you study about singularities that are not really defined by laws, because all of those laws of physics break down when you come to a singularity like the Big Bang, is something like religion able to answer some of those questions? And I guess for some of the questions that we still have in science now, around the metaphysical side of things, is religion able to answer those? For example, are um, Hauza's and Qum and Najaf, or if not, will they be able to answer them at any point? Thank you very much. So are they complementary? Um, in fact, thank you very much for the question. In fact, I will make my bold statement again. I respect all religions, and I'm speaking from an Islamic background. I will say science, science, the study of the physical world, is only one element in which this religion said f to its followers, go and advance it within it. So I'm not in this complex of having God or religion versus science. I start with religion firmly on a rational foundation, and this, uh, this rational foundation leads me to the belief in God with those attributes I quoted some of on the screen. Then the same process of thinking leads me to opening the Quran and it finding the Quran matches my rational conclusions about God. And then I take the Islamic model and an element of the Islamic model is the obligation to advance in science. So science is a small part of this life according to this, according to this religion, according to this model. Indeed, I'm against making science a philosophy. And here I would like to take the opportunity again to remind my colleagues in the scientific field, regardless of their levels, you need to step out of this laboratory and study a bit of philosophy. You need to study a bit of rationality, a bit of logic, because otherwise, you know, you are misusing what God has gifted you to create this invisible battle between religion and science, there is no such thing. And I, by the way, it's got a long history in the West, but that's because of history of the West. Don't try and superimpose this on the rest of humanity. We've never had a clash between science, the physical world, the study of the physical world, and Islam, uh, because of the history, because of this religion. So, and I'm, this obviously applies to everyone, to, to the whole of the world. Uh, regarding to your questions about singularity and, and, and theoretical physics, I would encourage people in this field and the audience not to compromise certainty for doubts. I repeat, please do not fall into the trap of compromising certainty for doubts. Rationality and logic leads to certainty. 
certainty. For every effect, there is a cause. This glass will never, ever, ever fall off the edge of the table if it was left alone. The effect, the event of falling will never take place, even if you leave it for a million years, unless there is a force, there is a cause that would push it in one direction. Causality is rationality, is logic, at least to certainty. Certain scientific observations which people have not managed to grasp, so there are doubts about the final conclusions. Please don't compromise certainty for doubts. That's, by the way, an approach in the West. It's a general kind of, uh, it's probably a misquote if I say it's a philosophy. There's a philosophy in the West, but I'll say it. Philosophy in the West to say, let's just accept doubt. Doubt about everything, 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 but don't do it. Because there's no clash and um, the answers will come. Uh, science cannot clash with logic. Because if it does clash with logic, you can't, ma you can't make scientific conclusions. I repeat that, and I know I need to explain it, but I don't probably have the time. If you do not accept logic, you cannot make a scientific conclusion. Because I could propose that, you know, whatever you are ascribing the effect to happened without a cause. That needs an explanation. But inshallah, just, it just opens the window for that. I think some of the doubts we, that, that seem to be fed to us on a daily basis, this is more of a discussion as well, so it doesn't have to just be questions if you've got any just comments you wanted to make. But it seems like, some, like you mentioned before about cancer. Every day we learn that uh, you know, apples cause cancer, then smoking cause cancer, then drinking X doesn't cause cancer and stops cancer. There's lots of doubts that get created um, that try and take away from some of the certainties that we know. So it's a very definitely, interesting definitely argument. Definitely have apples, yeah. There are some at the back, if there's any left. Just before I go to Brother Hassan, I've, got, I've been told there's a question or a comment that has 13 likes on the Slido page. So I think we have, to, we have to mention it if it's that popular. We know that scientific theories can change according to development. How can we trust that some Islamic theories won't change or develop with time, I guess? Thank you very much. Islamic theories. If it's an, a theory about a field in life, in which Islam did not make concrete recommendations, it left it open. It just, it just, that's what, that's, apart from ibadat, the relationship between you and Allah, and the relationship between you and others, the rest is left open. Probably some, some main kind of, uh, guiding points. If it's something that Islam has left, thank you very much. If Islam has left you the room to expand, and there is an Islamic theory about it, we accept that it could be wrong. Fine, there's no problem. But it should not be. This is this Islamic theory is, should not be about salah. That's why you have to be careful. If you've got a proposed theory about the health benefits of salah, and that theory tends to back turns in 50 years to be wrong, so what? We're not praying because we, we feel it's healthier for us, are we? Are we? Do we actually fast the month of Ramadan? Because in the 20th century, scientists have told us if you fast, you become healthier. Are we on a trading relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that I'll do it if I could see the evidence? Show me the evidence. What does the evidence say? If you fast, it reduces your blood pressure, it cuts down on your... Uh, uh, a kind of calorie intake, reduce the risk of diabetes. Okay, I'm happy with it. it makes sense. I'm going to fast. No, we don't do that. We fast because the model said fast. The model stated fast. Whether, of course, there is a wisdom behind fasting. Of course, there is a wisdom and maybe some health benefits to praying five times a day. But we don't do it because of that. So if people have Islamic theories about certain benefits or certain aspects of wisdom in Islam, Accept them, and they might be wrong, may be wrong, but it doesn't affect our uh, faith in the model because we don't follow the model based on the benefits, on, the, on these discoveries. Let me repeat how we follow the model. Rationality, God exists, what are his attributes, rationally speaking? You list them down, you spend weeks and months to study them, do it, 
And that's what people in Najaf and Qum do, by the way. They study that philosophy before they study the Quran, that rational thinking. You've ticked all the boxes, you know how God, Afwan, not how, what are the attributes of God? Now you open the Quran, the Holy Scripture, and you read it based on that rational thinking, and you start advancing and advancing and advancing. So the model is based on rational thinking. Holy Quran is proven to be the book of God, and then, yes, we blindly follow the model. And I guess jumping things like that we do don't necessarily have an adverse effect on us. For example, like fasting, you mentioned it there. Um, there haven't been people for a thousand years saying that it's actually going to harm you and kill you. This is, they've now found the positives of it. So the developments have actually come to back up the things that we do. Even Salah as a movement and as a, almost an exercise, I guess. Um, well, Hassan, Hassan, do you have a comment? And then afterwards. Sure. Um, good evening. Um, I'm Hassan. Hope you can all hear me, even though it's like a fake mic, isn't it? No, everyone can hear me. Um, I'm going to make a comment and a question. Um, my comment is, I don't know about anyone else, but I really feel we're holding back right now as an audience. Um, I think there's a lot of questions that we can still be asking, but we're not asking it, and I'm not sure why. So my question, if I can ask, first to the rest of the audience, if you'd like to answer, help me to answer this question, the crux of the subject, in my opinion, science versus God, let's be honest, 25% of the British population in 2011 described themselves as having no religion. Okay? Many more described themselves as being Christian or being Muslim, two biggest religions in the UK, but they're probably, eh, they, kind of, they say they're Christian or Muslim, but they're not particularly practicing. The crux of it for me is about the origin of life. Right? Science, for some people, explains the origin of life adequately. We have evolution, that explains where, how we can come from nothing into something. And also on top of that, you've got the universe and the Big Bang Theory and the multiverse theory, right? So long gone are the days where we can say, oh, we can't explain the Big Bang, because it's very simple. And I'm, all I'm doing is paraphrasing here what my friends were telling me at university. Multiverse theory, you just have as many universes as possible. They happen all, um, they expand, contract, expand, contract. One out of a billion, is bound to have the potential for life. That's the theory. There are physics and theoretical physics evidence that suggests that, and for a lot of people, that's convincing. So that's my, what I've heard from my colleagues and my friends at work and at university. And if I can just ask others in the audience, if perhaps you can share, if you've come across other questions or comments from your colleagues at work, or your friends at university or school along similar lines. Because I'd really be interested to hear what other people are hearing um, from the community and the society around us and how convincing these arguments really are. Thank you. As you were talking, I saw people's hands almost go up. So let's send, send the mic around a bit. Um, Haji Abu Karar, if you have a, a comment, please go for it. And if anybody else, just stick your hand up. I'll, I'll make a note that you want to speak afterwards. Assalamu alaikum. Thank you very much, doctor. Always uh, enlightening listening to you. And inshallah, it is the rewards in your mizan hasanat, and may Allah uh, raise your status. Um, we need to distinguish between two things, religion and God. When you speak to an atheist, they don't rule out the existence of God. What they say is, according to their scientific evidence, it has not yet proven to them that God exists. So they're open-minded, they're leaving a possibility that one day science may prove God's existence. However, they rule out religion straight away, saying that it is man-made and so on. Bearing in mind, so a few years ago only, like 100 years ago, that we believed that Earth was flat, and scientists proved otherwise, and they paid heavy price for that. Uh, ironically speaking, even now in our some countries, Muslim countries, believe that uh, earth is flat and whoever believes against otherwise he's not a muslim only one school yeah yeah politically funded we don't oil funded <laughs> okay so uh, however um, uh, it will be too late for them by the time science proves that god exists they would be perished and they will be really disappointed though when they raised 
uh, to face reality. Uh, what one would say, uh, argument-wise, you can apply all these uh, counter and uh, in support arguments of a God existence. They come up with another argument, the atheist, and they w go so far as to write books about something called nothing. Strauss, I believe, wrote a book, full thick book, uh, to prove nothing, that we, uh, the whole thing came from nothing. Th this is uh, uh, just uh, the challenge we face. However, we, uh, like uh, th there are things not uh, empirical, you can't measure them. Pain, happiness, uh, sadness, but there are indicators in the body that will actually indicate the existence of such uh, uh, phenomena like blood pressure, heartbeat, temperature. However, we apply the same argument. We say there are indicators around us in the environment that lead to Allah. And uh, the question is we need, sorry, I'm, I'm gonna finish. Uh, uh, Darwin theory is not there to prove God existence, by the way. He, he does not refer to... Uh, uh, to yeah, no, there's no point us trying to use, for example, intelligent design to prove God's existence against Darwin theory. He's not there, uh, his theory is not about the existence of God. And uh, even the origin, he doesn't say we originated from nothing. We came from single cell. So then you go back and say, okay, where that single cell, uh, single cell came from, and so on. So if you take them all the way back, they come up with this um, uh, uh, illogical argument. Yeah, okay, finished. One more thing, I mean, one, one trans to, what I use usually, if, if all uh, arguments trans out, you apply because they believe in probabilities. Most of the uh, atheist theories based on probabilities because they don't have solid evidence. So we apply the 50-50 probability. I do. Apply it 50-50 with the atheist. 50% that God exists and 50% he doesn't. Who's gonna be the winner after death? We'll uh, find out. I think on that point, Simple that's life. a fantastic point. Thank you. To, thank you very much. I think, um, a lot of these points are quite interesting for, I guess, the rest of us to hear because we hear them in these kind of debates and arguments. And by the way, Hassan Judy's comment, I will ask you what your reply is. I'm still holding that in my yeah. mind. But yeah, I'd like some more hands up if you can. From, there's been a few comments through and I'm, I'm losing track of the amount of different comments through, but you obviously have these comments. So, Munir, do, do you want to just read quickly? And I'll read sorry, Just to give them uh, justice. But can I just say, who knows a way of arguing, not argue, just discussing the proposal that Hassan Judy, thank you very much, Hassan, was quoted about the idea of the multiverse. That trial and error, infinite number of times, and there's some scientific hints to say that it exists. Well, what was the beginning of the multiverse? Okay, Hassan, the beginning. So, so the beginning, so where did it start from? yeah, so um, we're talking about here kind of life before, but also actually applying uh, logic and for every effect there's a cause. So before, before we discuss the design, the actual existence of something that is, you know, is dependent and limited, you need to explain it. But there's something else in the question. The brother in the back Thanks, Do you want to stand up just so we can all see and hear you? So the multiverse theory um, suggests that there's universes outside of our universe, which means that they're not detectable because in physics we can only detect things within our universe. I don't know. I don't know if there's theories to say that we can detect things, but either way, it's metaphysical. The same way the existence of God is metaphysical. So I don't know, like. If they say it is science disproving the existence of God, which is metaphysical for them, you can't use something that's outside of physics to disprove something outside of physics, which is my understanding. I don't know if you guys understood what I said, but... I did. Okay, cool. Thank you. Anyone else? Thank you very much. Any from, just bef sorry, just before we give to Brother Nakhi, anyone from the sisters live that wants to give a comment? No? Yeah, just one, just before we get to Brother Nakhi, so the sister here. Thank 
you. You can argue that in the Quran, it says that the angels, when speaking to God, said that, would you actually make mankind again to, like, yusfikun al Does that mean that there might have been more people before us? And this question, by the way, is, is a few times, I was going to get to this one, but there's a few different ones that go along the same line of being creation before Adam. Someone mentioned 70 Adams before Nabi Adam, um, the Prophet Adam, sorry. <coughs> so there's a few different questions on this same point. Thank you very much, sister. Um, and it, sorry, the brother who... Um, the Nafi, sorry. Brother Nafi, sorry. Can, does he have his hand? Uh, it's, it's coming. Okay. Thank you. I have to say before I mention my comment that even though a lot of scientists seem to be against God, the latest particle that was found was called the God particle. And I found <laughs> that really... Let's have a salawat. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. But on Brother Hassan's point, I absolutely agree with that. And what I feel in the West, a lot of people are turning more and more towards agnosticism or atheism. But I think even though science does not offer that certainty, Religion in many in instances seems to break that logic. So earlier, for example, when I was talking about singularities in physics, and then everyone of us understands that, yes, every effect has a cause, but then when you go to God, that sort of rationality or logic breaks down as well, because there has to be one initial cause, which in some ways was an effect, but then you're like, what caused that cause? And then... There's no answer. Or, for example, when Richard Dawkins was speaking to Mehdi Hassan and really, I guess, caught him on the flying horse. Uh, or things like that, which, which are obviously miracles in religion, but for science, fall outside of that theory. And I think what a lot of people in the West growing up find convincing is that science can make everything fit very well in a theory and answer those questions and constantly seek to evolve that understanding whereas religions, particularly I guess the traditional ones because of how they are, seem to be quite stagnant and seem to offer things which don't generally sit with the mind because they don't really form part of what we come across in our day-to-day -day lives and I have to say it's, it's really sad that I think religion hasn't done a great job with communicating some of that because as people become better at thinking I guess some of those questions really need to be answered because in the older generation, we would just we would just believe whatever we were told, but that's not the case now. And I think our approach to tackling some of that, particularly with the youth in, in religion, really needs to be revamped. Hassan, thank you very much. OK, so I'm going to address this point very, very quickly. You and you have to forgive minutes. me. Afwan. We've got the last few minutes now. Last few minutes, OK. And inshallah, we'll have other opportunities to go through them in details. So maybe another program dedicated to answering these questions. So number one, God cause and effect. So there's something in philosophy, which is the main problem. Where's Hassan? Hassan. The main problem is that people are fed misinformation. No one teaches rationality and logic. When was the last time you heard or you watched a documentary that teaches people what is rationality? What is cause and effect? What is the kind of the, the, the necessity of the independent being and so on? There is no information, there is misinformation. <laughs> Active misinformation. Why? Let's leave why. It's systematic, it's paid for, it has a direction. Because if you believe in religion, sorry, if you believe in God, then you start searching for a religion. If you believe in a religion, it has consequences. It restricts the human ego. And we don't want anyone to restrict us. بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانِ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَهِ The Quran says, states, man, the human being, wants to destroy, wants to break through whatever is restricting him or her. No barriers, no limits, no restrictions. Just let me free, let me be free. بَلْ يُرِيدُ الْإِنسَانِ لِيَفْجُرَ أَمَامَهِ No restrictions. And religion has restrictions. 
and I thank Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that there are religions surviving out there that's giving people restrictions and guidance. So very quickly, stop me, but I'll have to, يعني, stop me at any time, we need to finish. But the misinformation that quoted about the multiverse and the parallel verse, who knows what the difference is? The parallel universes is a theory that there is an existence here and a parallel existence there. It's got nothing to do with the existence of God. <laughs> we are fine, sister. God created more than one universe. Parallel. So what? But people, and there is some scientific evidence or suggestions. I'm not going to say it's right, but there's some proposal. That is misinformed, given as a misinformation to people. The multiverse is trial and error. What they're saying is chance for life to come through. You know, we, we studied the human cell, right? No one can manufacture it. So saying, how could you put it? The intelligent design. They're saying, no, there has been so many failures, infinite number of failures, and this one successive. So the others have all failed. They don't exist anymore. But it's the misinformation. It's the misinformation that, you know, people saying, the multiverse with the parallel universe. It's got nothing. These are two are completely different. For the multiverse that says infinite number of trials and they've failed, I thank the brother who studied physics who said, where's the evidence? Because that in itself, brothers and sisters, scientifically speaking, is not a theory. It's a proposal. What's the difference between theory and proposal? Theory, you've got some suggestions. <coughs> If, everything, if all these in the past have failed, where's your evidence that they failed? They don't exist anymore. So where's your evidence? It's the thought. You're proposing it, but where is your evidence? Science is meant to be on evidence. There's a phenomena. I've seen it, now I think, aha, uh -huh, so this, this dish that has bacteria in it, part of it is not growing. Alexander Fleming thought, this is an observation, I need to look what's, in, in, you know, what's causing the death of the bacteria, the fungus, penicillin. So there's an observation. Where is the observation for that proposal? But it's been mismarketed as a theory. So all of you teenagers, God does not exist because there's a new theory. It's not even a theory, it's a proposal. As for why is it wrong, and thank you very much because you can't study it, maybe I'll end with this. What if I say to you, and this is just to show you how the lack of teaching of logic and philosophy, it's so painful to see generations growing without it. What if I say to you, behind this wall, behind this wall, there's a lion. So none of you please leaves the room because the lion is behind the wall. And if you leave the room, you'll face the lion. How many of you would spend your life trapped in this room? How would you argue against me? I said, behind this wall exists a lion. Awesome question. Get the evidence. Sorry? An awesome question. For the evidence. Say, well, there could be a lion. I want you to stay here. There could be a lion. Stay in this room. Just stay. What would you say to that? I want to see it. Afwan? I want to see the line. So the evidence. What if I say, I don't have the evidence, but it could exist? Probably a few percent of the guys are going to just try it anyway. <laughs> because you don't actually believe me. Why? Because in philosophy they say, I'll quote it in Arabic, because I've studied it in Arabic. Should be taught in English. Should be taught to these poor teenagers who have been led away from God. In philosophy they say, Al-Aslu fil ashya al-Adam. The status quo for everything that does not exist until you prove that it exists. No, there is no lion. Show me the lion. So the status quo is it does not exist. You show me that it exists. So for someone to try and propose that there has been trials of universes that failed al-adam. those universes did not exist have never existed it's a thought in your mind show me the evidence that's what philosophy 
one statement, one sentence, it resolves a whole series of imagination and consequences and misguidance. You need to teach it to kids at school. You need to teach it here at centers, churches, mosques. It needs to be taught. Not misinformation campaign paid for. At university, I told my genetics tutor that genetics is, you know, genetics and logic is against the theory of Darwin. He said to me, Hassan, don't write this in the exam. <laughs> because they'll fail you. Awesome. Um, could I have a round of applause for Sayyid Hassan? <laughs>